Today, we're going to be speaking with Connell Gold, who is the founder and CTO at Sapar. Building upon his work at the University of Cambridge, Connell co-founded Sapar and leads the platform team, overseeing many of the technical aspects of the business, including app development, server infrastructure, statistics, and analytics collection and analysis, and in-house and consumer tooling. He and his team have built Sapar's platform from the ground up. It provides a completely vertically integrated technology stack, facilitating the production and distribution of AR experiences to tens of millions of end users worldwide without the need for external hosting services or additional expensive development environments or tools. Sapar's mission is to democratize AR to make it possible for anyone with a creative idea to leverage Sapar's workplace computer vision algorithms and content platforms to build fantastic and immersive experiences. I can't wait to begin this amazing interview with Connell. Let's do it. Thank you so much, Connell, for being here today. Please let us know how is everything going in the UK and if you can expand after that on your amazing background. Absolutely. Well, things are going well here in the UK, thanks. Although um, lots of crazy weather going on, which I think is true of a lot of Europe. Um, but thankfully, in our industry, we don't have to venture into the weather too much. Uh, mm -hmm. We deal with uh, augmented uh, virtual and mixed reality, XR in general, as you know. Um, and uh, my my background at Zapper is, um, well, we, I'm one of the co-founders of the company. Um, we started our business uh, probably 12 years ago now in 2011. So that's quite, quite a long time in our industry, I suppose. Uh, and it was the culmination of work that myself and one of my business partners, Simon, had been doing at university. We'd been looking at computer vision technology particularly computer vision technology that can run on mobile phones and be fast enough to run on these handsets that particularly in 2011 were actually very computationally under-resourced. You know, the phones were quite quite slow and didn't have much RAM, et cetera. Uh, and so we were working on technology for, for augmented reality for these handheld devices. Um, and my master's at the time was looking at content description for augmented reality, how you can describe experiences uh, that users can have in an augmented reality environment. Um, and then Simon and I founded uh, Zapper along with two others. And then from there, we have built out this business and this company and a set of tools and content, et cetera, that uh, makes Zapper what it is today. Wow, yeah, that has been an amazing journey. You guys have a lot of expertise and I actually see as a huge undertaking trying to break into a technology where the devices were not even totally ready, but you were such visionaries and continue to be. Thank you so much for expanding on that amazing background. So mm -hmm. um, can you shed some light on the next generation tooling that Sapar is building? Because I saw some... Um, presentations that you did and it sounds amazing especially what you mentioned vision and all of these um, uh, creations you actually won some awards as well recently is that correct thanks yeah uh, well just at awe the augmented world expo this year we uh won i think three augie awards which was was great um the uh we have a yeah suite of tools at zapper um and we're currently in the process of building and uh, distributing, I suppose, our next generation of creative tooling. Um, and I suppose the the uh, there are multiple facets to it and elements of it, but the most important thing about the next generation of our tooling is it's web first. So it's technology mm -hmm. that's deploying experiences that users will experience in their web browser, and that might be on their mobile phone, or it could be through a WebXR experience and a headset like for Quest, or we also have our own headset called Zapbox. So it's it's web-first tooling, which means 
it gets into users' hands very quickly. Uh, users mm -hmm. don't have to download apps or go through app store installation processes to get access to the content. And it's great for developers because it means you can publish that content, content instantly without having to go through an app store submission process. So you don't have to uh, go to the Oculus store and submit your application to Meta for them to review, or you don't have to go to Apple or Google and submit to the Play Store or the App Store. With web, you can deploy your content with the click of a button, and then users can access it instantly, be it through a web link or a QR code or, or something like that. So accessibility of content from an end user's perspective, reducing the friction for people to access the content and reducing the frictions to publish content are kind of what our next generation of tooling is all about. And so what we've tried to do is take all of the great uh, concepts and tooling that we have for native applications, uh, particularly, you know, native web XR and AR and VR applications and make those same types of development experiences possible for the web. Um, so whereas you've got great tooling like Unity with physics and a great rendering engine and lovely uh, tooling for the developer in terms of its scripting environment, et cetera, we're trying to get all of that goodness and all of that great conceptually uh, uh, expressive development environment. And we're trying to make that available in the web and for the web. Uh, and that's what our next generation tooling is basically all about. Wow, that sounds amazing. Especially because probably one of the best ways in terms of accessibility to access, even if it's in headsets or glasses, is going to be to be able to have the content there as well and to see it in any other device on the web, I believe, is, is one of those solutions rather than the apps. I feel the apps isolate more the possibility to have you know, the expansive, let's say, network where we can access everywhere. And uh, I, I'm so glad that you're creating this type of um, tools that facilitate for developers the access. And not, all, also, not only for developers, of course, as well for the consumer or the person who wants to be in touch with the experience. I wonder when you mention this um, availability for developers and facilitating this process as well, I have the feeling that towards the future, we're going to see more and more tools friendly for the ones that are not developers. So, you know, for example, designers that don't know per se how to code. Do you have any of that in your, in your creation, like the tooling and all of that? Absolutely. Um, we think a lot about that at Zapper, about how we can build tools tailored to the different types of creative expression that our users might have. So as you say, some might be developers who love coding and um, like an environment that uh, gives them all of the tools to code and to express their, what they're trying to build that way, you know, in addition to supporting them with other more visual tooling like, like we do. Um, but then there's also users who who don't care so much for the coding. They are very much primarily interested in um, producing visually and uh, designing content where they can see instantly what they're working with. And, you know, they don't have to go through complex technical processes like compiling of code and these sorts of things. Uh, and so we have a tool at Zapper that is very much for that, uh, that type of uh, creative developer. Um, it's called Designer um, and it's our kind of no code AR creation tool. Um, and so it supports all of our tracking types at Zapper. So it can uh, produce experiences that attract to users' faces. So for example, a face filter where you can kind of wear a funny hat or these types of experiences. It supports our image tracking. So experiences that, that are launched from an image, maybe it's a poster or a business card that 3D content can appear from. And it also supports our world tracking, which is where you have content that takes place in the 3D environment around about a user. Uh, at the moment, our designer tool is specifically for handheld AR. So that's experiences where users uh, will access the experience by holding the phone in front of them and they'll see the camera feed and the, the environment, either their face or the world around them, and they can explore the content that way. But we're looking at expanding that tool to also support headsets and other interesting ways of delivering content so that 
we have a kind of one-stop shop tool for no-code development of XR content. Um, and we're also then looking at how we can ease the transition from that tool to perhaps a more complex tool. We have a tool called Mattercraft at Zapper, which is our next generation content development tool, which is all more codey and lets you script and code. But we want to make that transition really easy for users. So they can start with a tool like Designer, which is perhaps a little bit simpler to use, but then uh, migrate uh, as as they wish or as the, as the need uh, as as their need requires to a tool that's perhaps more complex or more flexible, like Mattercraft. So we, yeah, try to get the best of both worlds: a simpler tool that's super easy to use but expressive and powerful, and at the other end of the scale, a tool where there's just unlimited flexibility. And then finding a way to help users find out where on that spectrum they're going to be able to be most creative and then help them if they want to move in one of the other directions in terms of increasing complexity or, or going simpler. Yeah, thank you so much. It seems that a great opportunity right now in the world, there are many creatives. And as you can see, usually designers of all kinds have been trying to adjust from all methods now to digital, touch screens, and other type of uh, media. And now there is another jump, which is the jump to using um, XR technologies to express that creativity. So giving them options to, for that, expand on that creativity is absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for doing all of that work. That is also another work that I believe it requires a lot of resources. It's not that easy to implement. Could you share what challenges did you face while developing these tools and how did you overcome them? Absolutely. When you're, whenever you're building any form of creative tool, I suppose, you know, be that Adobe building Photoshop or us building designer in Mattercraft or whomever, um, uh, there are a set of fundamental challenges. And those are around how you get the right balance in terms of complexity and expressiveness versus ease of use. And uh, they're not uh, uh, fully correlated, if you like. So, you know, it would be easy to say that the more complex a tool is, the more expressive it is. Or the other way around is for, for a tool to be very expressive, it has to be a very complicated tool to use. That's, that's often can be the case, but it's a, a it's uh, not correct to say that that's always the case. The challenge for people uh, building tools like we are is having tooling that is simple to use, but still allows as much flexibility and expressivity as possible. Um, and that's about finding the right uh, metaphors in the application you're building, finding the right ways of expressing different concepts, it's about concepts like progressive complexity. So where the tool starts off being really simple to use, but the user can opt in to saying, you know what, I'm interested in using the more complex animation tools. So I'll turn that feature on. And then that additional complexity and expressivity is there for them. But until that point that they've opted into that, they've not had to be overwhelmed by something that's that's too much or or, or more than they require up until that point. And so when we're building a tool like uh, Mattercraft, which is, I suppose our more, most powerful tool, we are thinking about the um, uh, how we introduce progressive complexity into it, how we make sure that the first time a user gets into that application, it's delightful and it doesn't scare them away with kind of complicated words or features. And we introduce them gently into the process of building, building content. And sometimes, you know, um, uh, you can help the user along with great examples and great tutorials, uh, but at the end of the day, the core product has to be simple, has to be easy to understand, uh, and has to map well to the types of tools that the users are already familiar with or, or, or the kind of ecosystems that they've been involved with in the past. So, for example, someone that's maybe a visual designer coming to a tool will have uh, a background where they're used to the types of interfaces from Adobe, so Photoshop mm -hmm. and Illustrator. Whereas somebody that's perhaps coming from a game development background will be more used to tools like Unity or Unreal. And these different tools have different paradigms for different things. They even have different densities to the user interface. You know, like if you're in Unity, there's lots of buttons everywhere that do mm -hmm. lots of different things. How do you know what each one does? Yes. Uh, 
Photoshop can be the same, um, but it's a little bit simpler in many ways and, and has different concepts in terms of what you're trying to create and how you do so. So trying to build a tool that can borrow the best bits of these conceptual uh, interfaces uh, can get the right balance in terms of density of user interface and density of, of um, just the kind of Chrome, if you like, the buttons and all of this sort of thing. Um, I, I, so, so that a user that comes into that environment isn't overwhelmed, but also can can kind of get the vibe of the application as well. You know, what you don't want to do is hide everything from a user in an experience or in, in a user interface. So that when the user starts your application, um, they kind of look around and they're like, well, there's nothing here. I don't, there's no features. <laughs> Whereas you don't want to put all of the buttons have, like straight away in front of them because they're like, oh, there's too many features here. I don't know where to start. Yeah. So getting that balance is is key. And, you know, one of the, the biggest challenges that we have when building something like Mattercraft and, and the kind of the way that we that we overcome that and deal with that is we have a ton of experience building creative tooling at Zapper, you know, this is our third generation of creative tooling here at Zapper. So we've got history and learnings that we've already had. We have a creative studio here at Zapper, which is a team of people building AR content for brands and businesses around the world. And what that means is we have some of our power users sitting right next to us. Mm. So we have the ability to communicate very directly and quickly with the people that are using our applications. And that means that the uh, end users who are perhaps using our tooling, um, but not within Zapper, get the benefit of that, that very rapid iteration that we've been able to have with users that have been sat within our walls here. So we've got a, a number of elements there that kind of give us a leg up and help us in terms of building those, those uh, content development tools. Oh, wow. Yeah, absolutely. I think that the striking that balance is a very difficult thing to do. But definitely the fact that you have these segments, the ones that is for creators using the tools and the ones that is for companies and end users, you know, being in the studio and having the test feedback, et cetera, helps a lot also to inform the creation of the tools as well at the same time. So that's a pretty good pretty good and solid foundation for the creation of those tools. Thank you for sharing that amazing journey. That sounds <laughs> no amazing. Way. It seems you, we're also, when we speak about XR, we're speaking about virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality. And you're, you're, you've been building for augmented reality and also handheld devices, et cetera, as well. But also you're becoming more and more involved also with mixed reality, it seems. And a headset or glasses are coming its way, I believe. Yeah, absolutely. So we have a product at Zapper called Zapbox. Mm -hmm. And the concept with Zapbox is, you know, we have these great headsets else, you know, already on the market, like Quest Pro, for example. We've had HoloLens uh, from Microsoft out for a number of years. Um, we know on the horizon next year, we have uh, Vision Pro coming from Apple. So these great high quality uh, headsets that enable these interesting mixed reality use cases. So this is where you're wearing a headset, uh, but you see the real world environment around you. So you're not you're not in a VR experience that completely isolates you from the world. You've got the headset on, but you see your real world environment. And uh, the mixed reality element is we can take that virtual content and bring it to your environment as if it was actually there. So you can imagine, for example, uh, let's say you're trying to teach anatomy to somebody, they could be wearing a headset where there's a, a skeleton or a human skeleton standing next to them, even though it's not there in the real world. And perhaps you can turn on the different layers to see the different parts, you know, like the organs versus the muscular layer, et cetera. So, so you have the full ability to render this content in the real world environment in a way that's really tactile to users so they can be you know interacting with it as if it was actually there and the problem has been that these headsets are expensive so you know quest pro vision pro um uh hololens thousands and thousands of dollars right to have just one headset that will enable this type of experience and so our thought was uh how can we take the device that's already in your pocket your smartphone and, 
and use all of the great technology that's already in the smartphone to provide that type of uh, mixed reality experience in a way that's way more affordable. Because you've already paid for the, the phone with the phone screen and the phone's camera and the phone's CPU and graphics card. You've already paid for that. Why do you have to buy another device that's got all of those same things? So what we've done is we've built a headset that's made out of plastic that you slot your phone into, and it comes with uh, two controllers as well. I have, I have one here. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. so to two controllers that are Bluetooth, and they, they attach to your phone via Bluetooth. Um, and the headset's got some lenses in it that sit between your eyes and the phone screen. And using our computer vision technology, we're able to then provide a fully mixed reality experience that's tracked in six degrees of freedom. So that what that means is that as you move around in your space, like if you move around in the room that you're in, the headset and the phone can uh, know and react exactly to where you are in the room. So you can walk around some content that's in your room and the, and the controllers are tracked. So, you know, much like if you've used a Quest experience where the controller you can hold up in front of your face and wave around and it the contents track to that controller that's exactly what we can do here with Zapbox and the 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 core like best bit about the whole thing is it's eighty dollars rather than like two thousand three thousand oh dollars <laughs> so from eighty dollars with your existing handset you can be having these mixed reality experiences that take wow. place in the world around you um, and uh, you don't have to be forking out for something incredibly expensive. That sounds unbelievable. I'm so glad that we're discussing about this. I, I feel that everyone should know about this. Uh, do you have actually the headset around there in the table or not? Not, not close? Oh, I think I maybe do. Uh, bear with me. Um, okay. Yes, it's fine. Yeah. yeah. Right. Thank you. I do have, I do have the headset. Oh, this is missing a little bit of it. One second. Yeah, it's okay. Um, Sounds okay. super exciting. Here we go. So this is what this is wow. what the headset looks like. And I'll describe it for those that are maybe listening audio only. Yeah. So um let me just assemble it a little bit one sec. So it has two elements effectively. It has yeah. a headband that goes round your head. Yeah. Um, and a little ratchet that you use to oh, tighten it is. Adjust. a nice sound there uh, a little ratchet to uh, tighten and loosen the headset on your head and then there's a mount with lenses in front of the headset mm -hmm. that you can adjust uh, forwards and backwards I wonder if I can show that so you can adjust wow. it forwards and backwards like this so that the mm -hmm. lenses are in front of your eyes at the right distance okay. And then your phone just slots into the front. So the phone just gets popped into the, wow. the mount at the front. That's um, awesome. So the headset is quite what we call an open peripheral. So mm -hmm. unlike something like Quest or indeed the Vision Pro, which completely covers your view of the world. So that when you put a Quest headset on, you can only see the inside of the Quest with that box, when you're wearing it, it's really open. And, and we've intentionally made the uh, the harness or the holder for your phone at the front is made of clear plastic, so it's transparent. Uh, and the purpose is when the phone is in the headset and you're wearing it, you can still very much see the periphery around you, your real world environment. Like um... this is a headset for mixed reality and, and taking place in your world. We're not trying to... We're not trying to hide the world from you. We're trying to let you interact with the world. And so this open peripheral lets you do that. There's a, a really nice effect as well, which so on the lenses um, that are on the device or in the headset, um, there's no edge to one side of the lens. So there's a, there's a on the, on the central elements of the lens, there's a little bit of plastic which holds the lens in place. But on the outside sides of the lenses, there's, n there's no edge. And what that means is that when your headset is in the device, um, the the headset shows the camera that it, it is detecting in the world in front of it. The uh, lenses then, because of the nature of them, blur that camera with your real world environment. So you can't see the edge of your phone. So it feels very much like you've got this 
uniform representation of the world in front of you. It doesn't feel like you've got a phone in front of your eyes, is what I'm trying to say. It feels yeah. like you're just really perceiving the world around mm-hmm. you, even though some of that is being rendered by a mobile phone sitting in the headset. As I say, it comes in addition to the headset, it comes with two Bluetooth mm-hmm. controllers. Mm-hmm. And um, they have uh, the same inputs effectively as a Quest does. So they've got a trigger, mm-hmm. they've got a, a a grip switch on the inside. They have a, a thumb stick and they have three buttons. And that's this, basically the same inputs as a Quest controller has. And the, the reason for that is it means content that's built for Quest, say in Unity, can then be built directly for Zapbox without any modifications so that if you've already built some content, perhaps you've made a game or you've made a, an experience in Unity for uh, Quest, it should just be a case of importing the Zapbox SDK and compiling and building for Zapbox instead of building for Quest. Uh, all of the controller input and mapping should be the same. That sounds fascinating. In fact, for example, I am building an experience that is all about mindfulness and relaxation and the music, beautiful experience. And knowing that as well, that's such a great invitation, not only for me, but for everyone to now that we know, transfer our experiences as well to Zapar as it is so accessible for not only developers, creators, but also the public in general. It is unbelievable. I really, I want to support this as much as I can. I like to Thank make you. a couple of videos about this. And um, I wonder now, I mean, this is the last question. And it's related with, you know, that we are at the stage, technology is evolving super fast. We're at the stage where the, these even XR technologies are mixing or integrating capabilities of machine learning, artificial intelligence, et cetera. Do you see anything in the future there, some sort of integration or, or with this type of tools or what are your thoughts with uh, support towards the future? Mm, absolutely. I think from my perspective, you know, there is a lot of fantastically interesting work with AI at the moment, as we know. Uh, I think it's important to recognize that, uh, particularly when you look at other technologies like XR, but I think the same is true of any other non-AI technology, if you like, um, that there are many benefits to the types of experiences we can give users, even if they don't have an AI element. So, um mm. Yeah. Uh, for example, we have a, with Zapbox, we've got a couple of bits of content that we're producing at Zapper so that people have got some something to try. We have a pool game, uh, uh, like snooker, you, you know, like a pool where you've got a pool cue and balls on the table and you've got to pop them into the pockets. So we've got a game like that, that is... Uh, mixed reality. So you put the headset on and it takes place in front of you using the controllers and you can play with somebody else in the same space or you can play with someone remotely where they can be somewhere else and are wearing a headset there. And it's just a, a great experience. Um, it doesn't need any AI, right? So it's still a fantastic experience. But then we also have another bit of content for Zapbox, which is a chess game. And we have an AI powered opponent that you can play against um, of different levels. And you can have like a conversation with that AI wow. um, uh, player to ask for tips about how you're doing and like whether or not this is a good idea or these sorts of things. And so there's a really nice intersection there between augmented reality or mixed reality in this case and artificial intelligence where you can have um you know an artificial actor taking part in an experience that really adds to the realism adds to the value of that experience for the user so i think it's it's uh there's going to be a ton of really interesting places Mm. in the in the next you know three four plus years where we're seeing the intersection between xr and ai um but i would just caveat that with there's going to be a ton of great experiences that don't need that AI element either. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think just a good balanced view of what content and great content looks like is, is going to be important. I think, you know, there's also on the other side of the, of the uh, content creation um, uh, concept, we have creative 
tooling around building content and how we can help use AI to accelerate that type of content development. So, you know, um, AI that can help refine a 3D model you've been building or can um, make the textures for the 3D model or can uh, design other assets and imagery for your experience. These sorts of things are going to be super interesting for creative tooling going forward. Um, and so we'll keep a good eye on that at Zapper. Um, but we are firmly of the belief, you know, at the end of the day, a creative developer that's going to be using our tooling to build content is going to have the best idea for what's good for their users. Um, and so we're going to remain very much user focused at Zapper, even if we do end up in, incorporating a, a, artificial intelligence elements into our products to help those those content developers accelerate the process that they're trying to achieve. Wow, yeah, sounds fantastic. You really are, Zafar is always at the cutting edge of everything that is going in the world. It's an amazing studio. I'm of course, Sharing up for Zapar and anybody who is listening, please consider sharing this with any of your friends or family who might be excited about these technologies as well. Um, is there anything else that you wish I had asked you today, Connor? Um, I don't think so, other than to say, I think it's a great time at the moment for people to be getting started with XR and building content for XR, including AR and VR. I think, um, you know, some fantastic uh, uh, hardware in play, as we spoke about the Quest Pro, the Vision Pro. Uh, of course, we'll, I'll, I'll add our Zap box into the mix. Um, but never before has there been such great hardware for this type of content and this type of technology. The mobile devices are powerful. They've got great cameras. Now is a perfect time to be getting involved with XR, I would say. Um, so if you have any listeners that are are uh, deciding if now is the right time to jump in and start using some tools and start building some content, I would say it is because in the next couple of years, it's, it's only going to get better. Thank you so much. Before we go, I'd like to know exactly how can we get in our hands one of those sub box? <laughs> how can we get it? <laughs> If you head um, to our website, zapper.com, there's a zap box button there. You can go and uh, purchase a zap box. Um, they're, they're uh, yeah, ready ready there for you to to, uh, oh. to go and get. Uh, we're just at the start of the process of getting our content out for Zapbox, mm -hmm. getting our developer tooling out. So plugins for things like Unity for building the content. So we're still early stages, um, but over the next weeks and months, we've got more content coming out and uh, more tools and support for those content developers. Um, the great thing about Zapbox also is once you have the headset, um, if you need a more powerful, uh, you know, if, if in the future there's a more powerful phone or a more powerful graphics card or a graphics chip in your phone, just by upgrading your phone, you're upgrading the ability of that device. Uh, whereas it's not like when you buy an Oculus Quest, right? It's the it's the CPU that's built into it. So it's hopefully a device that will scale over time with your with your phone. Um, and so uh, it's just a yeah a great piece of kit to start building with. I think that you're making big waves in history. Thank you so much for so much creativity, so much work done with all of this and to bring us such an amazing experiences to enhance our human lives. It's been amazing, all of this talk that we've had together today. We learned so many things. Thank you so much, Connell. And we, of course, are going to keep in contact with all the great things that you are promoting and taking outside. Congratulations for all the awards that you have won so far. We're going to continue sharing your work and continue to be friends. Thank you so much, <laughs> Connell, for your amazing talk today. No worries. Thank you, so you very much for having me. Yes. Thank you so much to the audience and see you in the next episode. Bye for now. <laughs>